Okay. Hello, and welcome to the Collider Podcast. I'm Collider Senior Editor Matt Goldberg, and with me is Managing Editor Adam Chitwood. Howdy, folks. And Senior Producer Perry Nemiroff. Hi, hi. Today we'll be talking about the 2021 Sundance Film Festival, which was held at home this year. It was an all-virtual festival. We were not trekking through the cold of Park City, Utah, but we did still see some films in a, in a very different year for Sundance. Um, normally the festival runs 10 days. This year it was only seven. Um, there were sort of screening blocks of, you know, what do you see? And then there was second screening opportunities, but those could sell out. It was very weird. It was very weird to try to sort of like, what do you see? And then of course there was the films themselves where it felt like uh, various producers and, and, and just, you know, they didn't want to bring films that they thought could make a splash um, or, of, or a way to build buzz uh, if it already had distribution. And so you got kind of almost a skeletal Sundance and yet one that still, I think had some, some good films to it. Um, you know, and so Perry, I want to, I want to start with you. You know, what was your experience with Sundance this year? I mean, I'm happy we got something at all. It's definitely completely different. And I feel like you guys well know, and everybody out there knows that I thrive doing interviews and being in that space where it's not just about sitting in front of the camera and doing the interview, but I don't know, it's just like, it's a fun community to be a part of just casually talking about your experience. And even though I did get to do some remote interviews this year, it's not the same kind of conversation before and after the cameras are rolling as far as, so what are you seeing? What are you doing? There's like that extra added excitement that I really missed. But again, I am glad they did this than nothing at all. I did find some of the uh, the screening access difficult to, to navigate and understand, and I might have made a few mistakes right out the gate that sacrificed particular screeners, but I did figure it out eventually. It's like, I, don't, I obviously do not want this to happen again next year, but if we were to cover another festival the same built the same exact way a couple of months from now, I feel like I could get a lot more out of it. Well, South by is in a couple months, so. <laughs> that's, that's fair. It is interesting because, I mean, it, we're learning, I think, through this pandemic, we're learning. Uh, and I, I do think there were, like, advances made during the pandemic in terms of, you know, companies realizing the benefits of working from home, which I think benefit the environment. Um, but I think we're learning through the virtual film festival setting that it doesn't quite work very well. Uh, like they do their best, um, but the entire, especially Sundance, uh, the entire kind of point of it is to be there, to be on the ground, the electricity of getting out of screenings. I mean, so uh, for those who don't know, the, the Sundance is different from other, like a, a TIFF or something in that, uh, the Toronto International Film Festival, um, and that a lot of the films that come to Sundance don't have distribution. So they're looking for buyers. They're looking for people, for studios to say, we want that movie, we want to put it out, whether it's on a streamer or in theaters. More recently, it's been on on streamers. Um, but part of the way they gauge that is they sit in the audience and the, they can hear the audience's reaction. Um, so you'll get, you know, rapturous applause and that, you know, erupts into bidding wars where studios are fighting over stuff. Uh, and this year, I think, it, you know, we've talked a lot on the podcast about like the benefits of, of being in a theater and seeing a movie for the first time in the theater. But I feel like watching some of these films, uh, particularly the bad ones, uh, were a little rougher at home. Um, but even the good ones, it felt like, you know, you can gauge it, but it was weird to, so part of the Sundance experience is you go to a movie and then right after it's over, you talk to your friends and fellow critics and fellow journalists. What did you think? You argue about it. You talk about it. Like, that's part of it. It was weird this year to, like, see a movie and then be like, huh, like, well, I know what I felt, but I have no idea to gauge, like, how other people felt about this. Um, because, again, watching films is is a communal experience, I think, in, in its best format. And I think something about Sundance doesn't quite click right with the virtual experience. Yeah, I, I mean, I've certainly felt that, you know, when I would, whether I saw like a really good film or a really bad film, I felt isolated with yeah. it. I, I didn't feel like I was basically, I have 
the, I had the Sundance app on my Apple TV and my Apple TV is in my bedroom. And so I'm just watching these movies in my bedroom and it's just like, you know, I, I'm getting, I can, I can get up and stand if I want, I can pause it if I want. Um, I'm not in there with it. And obviously like I'm working to like pay attention, but like nothing's stopping me from, for instance, when I watched the first film I watched of this year's festival was John in the hole, which I thought was terrible. And I literally just yelled out in the middle of my, my bedroom, who fucking cares? <laughs> like just because I could, but like, that's not really the experience of Sundance. That's just ultimately <laughs> me watching some programmed films in my bedroom. And it, it just, I don't know. It's again, it's hard to capture what Sundance is from any festival, really. Like I don't think Sundance really has its imitators because it's such a singular experience of being in the cold of Park City and standing by the heat lamps and catching a bus to the Eccles and you stand in a tent and then you 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 try to find a seat and you know, you just you you you're in that momentum. It's carrying you along from film to film and you know you wake up early and you're 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 you go to bed exhausted but you saw like four or five films that day this is me at home this is just me at home being like well time to pop on may day and see what that's all about there's there's some pros and cons i'll say one of the pros for me is i felt like i was a little more open to just clicking on whatever movie if i had time it's like I've I've caught myself binging two or three movies after work hours, and sometimes I didn't even mark them off. I just see they have the watch now button on it because I went on a favoriting binge at some point just because I realized that got me access to almost everything I wanted. And I, I definitely watched a lot of things that I might not have had we been in Park City and had to trek from one theater to the next and, and just accommodate the time that all that takes. But I, I might be guilty of some very similar things as much as I love, you know, hanging out at home, watching a movie with, with Dewey in my lap. It was, you know, like I'm living in a house with three other people and they're very respectful of, of my time and the time that I put into my work. But sometimes, you know, I'm watching a movie and someone knocks on my door and that is a distraction that would not have been a possibility had I physically been at Sundance and, you know, that then leads me to think if they ever do this again, maybe a four hour screening window is a little unnecessary. Maybe they should lengthen that. And I'm talking about the four hour screening window that you get once you click play, because there's certain things that we can't control when we're not in the Sundance bubble and we're still being exposed to other things happening in the industry that aren't Sundance related. And I am definitely not complaining about anything else that I've covered in the past week because I've loved some of the things that I've done. But when you're there in Park City, it truly is like the rest of the world melts away and you could be laser focused on covering this one thing to the fullest. And that definitely contributes to the experience. I also, I definitely think there there could and should be a virtual component going forward. Because I think for general audiences, people who don't, who can't afford to go to Park City, I think it's are kind of nice to be able to allow them to watch some of these films. Um, and I think the app worked pretty well. I had the same problem with the window and, you know, there, I was a little confused. And so I clicked watch now and I was like, oh, I'll come back to it. And it was expired. So then I couldn't watch that movie. Um, which was a little frustrating. By and large, the app is pretty easy to use. So you sell those individual tickets to like people across the world. Um, you're opening access to indie filmmaking that you know they may not uh, have access to um, in other times. Even when films like this get picked up, a lot of them only go to New York and LA, and then maybe you can buy it on VOD or something. So it'd be kind of nice if if they added that going forward. But I do you think for people doing their job uh, as a as a critic? or an interviewer or journalist, it is harder to do it from home, I found. Um, Cause I had the same problem with distractions and, you know, timing, you know, it, when my fiance gets off work and can I start this now? And do you want to watch this? And um, she also was like, Ooh, that's rough. I don't want to watch that movie. And I was like, Oh, this is Sundance. It's just a hodgepodge of like strange indie filmmaking. So, um, well, you know, to build off what you said, you know, another thing, something that Sundance did do this year that I think that I would also like to see them continue is satellite screenings where they, partnered with art houses across the country to be like certain films that are playing at Sundance will also play in these art houses. And I think that would be really beneficial, especially for, uh, I just got done watching this year's winner, Coda, uh, which won all the awards. It won audience award, jury award, I think director. Um, and, uh, but it's, you know, 
I watched that film and it's a crowd pleaser, really. And I can, I was imagine, like, and I enjoyed watching it on my own and I can see why Apple uh, picked it up for 25 million, um, which is the highest that, it's the biggest sale ever in Sundance history. But at the same time, I'm like, oh, if I had seen this with a crowd, it would have brought the house down because it ha it, no it has the right beats of like really, like it's funny and it's heartwarming and like it's emotional. It really checks those boxes. And I would love it, you know, if for, for that kind of movie to be seen with a crowd, even though I think it will work at home. Coda played especially well. Like that was that was probably one of the few movies that I watched because I love Sundance. Literally every single time I watched a movie, I caught myself thinking, what would it be like to watch this in Park City after? And that was one of the ones where I felt so much certainty that whether I saw it with an audience or not, I was still going to absolutely adore that movie. The one that really confused me in that respect, though, which I'm I'm still fairly certain I just didn't like this movie. It was not for me, and it makes no sense, is Prisoners of the Ghost Land. Like, I, I kind of knew, just based on my taste, that I wasn't going to be into that movie the second I pushed play, but it's Nicolas Cage, and the stills look so beautiful. I had to at least try it. And then, sure enough, I didn't like it, and I kind of couldn't wait for it to be over. But that is one of those kinds of movies that... I'm wondering if I might have got a little more caught up in the energy of it all had it been a midnight screening with a packed house with people, you know, being vocal at just the right moments. But instead, I, you know, I watched it in my bedroom and <laughs> didn't have much of a reaction to it. Yeah, I mean, midnighters are all about the crowd. I mean, to just to, to watch a midnighter by yourself, it has to be real good to sort of, you know, stick yeah. out in that way. That might be why I don't think, like, I have a list right here of all the movies I wound up seeing, and, and I've ranked them all, mm -hmm. and the few Midnighters I saw are actually all at the bottom. <laughs> I think, I was talking to Matt about this, I think that the bad movies, and there are bad movies at Sundance, I don't think it's, you know, being mean to say, like, you see movies that are not good at Sundance every year. Um, the bad movies were especially, so there's something about, like, choosing to go to a press screening of a movie at a specific time at Sundance and I'm in the holiday village and I've chosen to watch this movie and it's bad, but literally what else am I doing? But when I'm at home watching a bad movie, literally anything else I could be doing and it's harder to stick with it and hang with it. And like, uh, I mean, Matt, you talked about like yelling, who cares? Uh, it, that recalled to mind a screening of yoga hosers a few years ago <laughs> in a sparsely populated theater and one journalist at some point just took his notebook and threw it in the aisle because <laughs> he was just so disgusted yep. with what was happening on screen uh which was funny but like that's you know what else were we gonna do we had chosen to see that movie at that time and, right there, you know and it, at that point you could talk yeah, about at that it point afterwards. like yeah, you could walk out, but like then you've just wasted the time. You like yeah. you compound how much time you wasted because now you can't write a review out of it. You can't do anything with it. It's just gone. <laughs> you know, whereas I mean, like yeah, yeah, I was I was watching like a bad movie at home and I was like I'd rather be playing Zelda. <laughs> Why can't I be playing <laughs> Zelda right now? Uh at, speaking about audience reaction, I was also curious like a film like On the Count of 3, I think really benefits from seeing with a crowd because it's hard to um, and the plot of this movie, it will say trigger warning for self-harm because the plot of this movie hinges on self-harm. Um, so if that's not something you want to hear, that's what we might be discussing here in a minute. Um, but that movie is very ambitious and takes some really wild swings and like toes the line and maybe goes over the line into like offensive or harmful or not harmful or not offensive. You could debate it. You could discuss it. So watching that one alone was really tough because not only was I kind of like emotionally upset about the movie like i also had no one to talk to and no like no one else to gauge like how did you guys feel about it and like you know go and get grab a beer after the film and talk i think we're all like we're just talking around the fact that like it's great to see movies with people in theaters is kind of the point of all <laughs> yeah, of this. I just, film festival like sundance is happening because it has to happen like there's an entire sundance institute there's people whose job it is i felt really bad for the um the head programmer whose name I can't recall right now, but this was her first year. She basically took yeah. over after, to be fair, Sundance was kind of starting to slump a little bit. Like it wasn't, yeah. it wasn't really making waves like it had in the past. And so she was kind of brought in. I think, you know, they, 
they promoted her to be like, let's give some fresh blood. And her first year, she has to do this, which I don't think is a fair assessment of anyone's ability. I think when you make a virtual festival like this, your victory is the festival happened. And it did. So I think Sundance should be applauded for that. Um, I'm very curious to see what Sundance looks like in 2022. I want to physically be there so badly. <laughs> yeah. I actually like maybe it'll it'll kind of snap back even stronger, and that that's kind of my prediction for for everything mm -hmm. when it's safe, at least for festivals, for conventions, for movie theaters, assuming they're operational. I just think that because we've been longing for them so long, when it is actually safe to really just go full force and get back to it, they're going to see a pretty big boost or at least speaking from a personal standpoint, I know I'm going to feel that way and approach them that way. Just to give them a little credit for what they were working with, though, this year, I do think that the social media response did help me in some cases. There were a couple of movies where I chose the premiere window, and immediately after I screened them, I was able to go to social media, and maybe it's because I live in a film bubble and a lot of people that I follow participate in Sundance, but it did feel like there was a very active conversation. Not the same as going to a bar and grabbing a beer and talking about something, but it did feel like a conversation that I could actually be a part of as it happened live. And Speaking of the live element, I did like what they what they wound up doing with the post-screening Q&As. I thought, for the most part, those were very well orchestrated and had a very in-the-now kind of feeling to them because they had the, uh, the questions coming in. They had the moderator mod moderating the conversation, as always, but they were able to incorporate live questions after people watched the movie and... The few, the I admittedly did not watch a lot of post-screening Q and A's because, as we've already said, there is that feeling like you can get up and go do something else. But of the few that I watched, I I just I really enjoyed the conversation. You could kind of feel the passion for the film that they created radiating off the screen, and whether or not I liked the movie, like I needed that feeling. I needed to be able to tap into that. And I no longer felt embarrassed leaving while they were talking on stage. <laughs> like I got, I sorry, I have to go to another screening. Great movie, oh, great movie, oh, great God. movie. I got the, the the second the credits roll, I gotta get out of here. I gotta <laughs> run to the to there, the library. There's that, and there's also the bonus of being able to, you know, have a snack during a movie. Yes, that yeah. would have been screening in Eccles. Yeah, my, my biggest plus is that uh, because I was I I my I have my dog here with me. I can just hang out with my dog and be like, yeah. "What do you think, Jack?" And he just doesn't care. <laughs> so I met two dogs during uh, Sundance interviews this year, and I can't say that for any other year. <laughs> there you go. Not a, more more dogs at Sundance, please. Is I think what we all that. we all want. So. Um, uh, Perry, what was what would you say are the films that you think? I mean, I think I want to be make this podcast a a service to our listeners about films that they should keep on their radar this year that played at Sundance. So, what what do you think people should be on the lookout for? Code is the big one for me. I mean, you said it, Matt. It is really the ultimate crowd pleaser, and I say the ultimate crowd pleaser because it has all of those feelings that you know and love from those type of types of movies and. It earns every single one of them. It's just, I think the way I described it in my review is that it uses a lot of coming of age crowd pleaser conventions, but it uses them in a way to kind of bolster the unique elements of the movie that we don't see as often. And it made it especially powerful. My heart was like bursting at the seams by the end of it. And, you know, given, given the tone in the air right now, I needed a movie like that. On the flip side, in a sense, so Coda was my number one. I don't, okay, I don't know why I felt, uh, I felt quickly, the need to rank everything, but I did. What is what Coda is, about? I have not oh, seen Oh, I'm Coda. sorry. That would I don't think anyone else be a good it. thing to point, point out here. So Coda is about a young woman who I believe is in her senior year of high school, and she's the only hearing member of a deaf family. So it's about her balancing the need to help support their uh, fishing business because they rely on her to communicate with the other hearing people who work on that dock, and also her trying to uh, find some independence and also pursue her dream, which she discovers that she has a real passion and talent for singing. And clearly that causes some conflict with her family that they can't take part in her passion, or at least it seems that way. That is generally what the movie is about. I can already picture myself in Echoes after that movie being like, oh, I'm not crying, I'm not crying, don't look yeah. at me, nobody look. 
I, d- yeah, I did that. that. There, there might have been a, like a blanket smothering my tears, but they were there. So and on that, the flip side of Coda, what was what was what was? <laughs> I mean, this is like a pretty drastic shift here. So Coda was my number one, and my number two was Mass, which oh, I was yeah. mighty nervous to watch. And and before you get into Mass, I, I like to me like that goes back to what we were saying about the whole you know, I'm at home. What Like if I were in a, like if I were at sentence, I'd be like, you know what? I can, I have nothing else. To, I've, I've, I've committed to this time frame. I'll see this movie. And then like, I'll treat myself to like a burrito or something, you know, like I like, well, I will, I, the, the fresh air of Sundance, I will get out of it. But like, I don't want to sit with mass in my home because mass is about the fallout from a, 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 a shooting. <laughs> I mean, it's, It's not an easy watch whatsoever. I mean, from top to bottom, it is, it's really giving you an emotional workout and it's not something that you shake off after it ends either. But I don't know, I'm kind of okay with that when it's, it's a good movie that really earns every ounce of emotion that I felt. And it, it, sparks a worthwhile conversation too. And, you know, I wouldn't necessarily say the movie delves deep into, you know, the problem this country has with guns and how to fix that problem necessarily. It's a, it's a very intimate and deeply emotional experience of, of two particular families, two particular families that are having a, a, like a, a fairly different, but also somewhat overlapping response to an incident like that. And I just can't believe that that movie is a feature directorial debut. And it's from Fran Kranz, who a lot of people probably know from Cabin in the Woods. He's an actor. This, I I can't say I'm behind every single choice he makes in this as a director. There's one particular thing that kept kind of pulling me out of it. He every so often cuts away from the one room the large majority of the movie takes place in. And when he did that, I didn't find that it served the material in the room very well. But Other than that, the script is kind of incredible. And these might be some of the best performances I've seen in a long, long while, especially. So here, here's a, here's a thought I've been having because a couple of people have thrown this out there, whether it's for this movie or other movies, like let's say Coda, which now belongs to Apple, that technically they could release the movie and, you know, create a major shakeup in award season that we're experiencing right now. This is a move. I, I don't think they should do this because I think they should take the time to build it. Cause I think they have real awards potential for, I mean, really everybody, but in particular, I would say Martha Plimpton and, and Dowd have the best shot to me, the best chance, bad choice of words, my apologies. But um, I really do think that they are deserving of that kind of honor. I know that's a, an extreme thing to say when you're only a month into the year, but they're, they're, they should go all the way in my book. I'm not going to promise that they are because you never know what's going to happen and what's going to come out movie wise. But I, I think they're absolutely phenomenal in this. I would say make the bold prediction. Be like that guy who was like J.K. Simmons is going to win Best Supporting Actor for Whiplash. <laughs> who I, was that? I can't remember. I forget. I get who it was, but but they were on the money. Yeah. <laughs> See that that's even a tough statement to make for this kind of movie because I'm not even a hundred percent certain who's going to fall into what category. I mean, I guess if I were, were to make the the most likely prediction, it would be Martha Plimpton in best in a uh, the best act actress category, and then uh, Anne Dowd for supporting. I'm gonna say if I if I want to make that statement right now, I'm gonna say Anne Dowd wins for Best Supporting Actress. Let's do it. All right, you okay. heard it here first. I'll stand by <laughs> it. <laughs> so what uh, what did you not care for? What was or should we or should we just keep that? <laughs> Name under- names. I, I'll go there. I'll go there. It's you know it's part of the game. I already mentioned um, Prisoners of the Ghostland, which which definitely wasn't for me, but. I visually from top to bottom, I was riveted. That is a beautifully shot movie. The production and costume design is absolutely fascinating. I could have watched the whole movie on mute and still found myself wanting to keep watching to look at every single uh, every single frame in that movie. The other one that's fairly low down on my list is Romeo and Juliet, unfortunately. I believe you I, mean our hashtag J. It's not. I asked. That was the first question <laughs> of my interview because I've been 
like up until I saw the Q and A for that movie, I kept saying our hashtag J. Just like that's like that is the other thing too. I feel like there's so many titles and names that I haven't had to say out loud until I did have to say them out loud because I have no one to talk about these things with. So in my mind, it's been our hashtag J until it's confirmed that they want it pronounced Romeo and Juliet. So I love screen life. And I really, I truly do admire what they tried to do with this movie, which is basically mash up Shakespeare and screen life, something that is very, very modern with something that isn't. And it just, it goes together like oil and water for me. I think that uh, the director, Carrie Williams, does show great promise creatively, but these two things just, they didn't, they didn't work. The uh, the choice to go with uh, classic uh, Shakespearean dialect really took me out of the movie, for the dialogue at least. The text messages and things that you see on screen are written as as we would speak in modern days. And the the two things just just clashed. And when it comes to uh, when it comes to screen life, I know this is important with every movie out there, but with screen screen life in particular, I feel like you need the utmost natural performance or you're not going to have that feeling like, I don't know why uh, this isn't screen life, but Blair Witch is coming to mind. You know, that feeling like you're, you don't know whether or not something's real. I feel like a lot of screen life movies need that quality to it. And this one just didn't have it at all. And I think it's because they, they stayed so true to the text in some, in the, the dialogue aspect, at least. Well, that's good to know. <laughs> um, Adam, Adam, what did you really like at uh, at Sundance this year? I think I know what your answer is, but I'm going to let you have it. <laughs> um, I will say on the Romeo and Juliet thing, uh, my fiance works with a bunch of like 19, 20 year olds, uh, not a bunch, but like a number of them. And they call Baz Luhrmann's film Romeo plus Juliet because they have not been around to hear people pronounce it. And they just read it on Netflix or whatever it's on. So I thought that was funny. <laughs> Romeo plus Juliet is what the kids are calling uh, Baz Luhrmann's uh, interesting adaptation. I like that. Very but. random thing. The R the R hashtag J format also just stresses me out from an SEO perspective. <laughs> yeah. like, what I have an interview to write up. What am I going to do with that? I yeah, good luck with that. We do not know. <laughs> um. My favorite film of the festival uh, was Edgar Wright's documentary, The Sparks Brothers, uh, which is probably Matt's answer as well. Um, uh, no. Maybe not. We'll see. No, it's, oh. it's, it's, surprise, yeah. surprise. Surprise, surprise. Uh, um, I did not see Coda, but um, it's Edgar Wright's first documentary. It's about the band Sparks, which I had never heard of. I think I vaguely heard of them through Edgar Wright. I think they were on one of his soundtracks. Um, they've been around for 50 years. They've been making music for that entire time. They've been up and down. They've made over 25 albums. They change their musical style very frequently. Um, but like, you don't have to know anything about it. I think Matt put it perfectly where it's like, it's like someone telling you about their favorite band. And by the end, they became, they become one of your favorite bands too. Uh, like Edgar Wright's passion for this band shines through. And like the film is irreverent, just like the Sparks brothers are irreverent because I was looking up, they're both in their seventies now. Uh, and I was trying to find, cause the film doesn't delve into their personal lives at all. And apparently you, no one knows, like they keep it enigmatic. They will not say if they are married, if they have children, like they love to keep the aura of mystique of the Sparks brothers. And that kind of that playful, like a lot of their songs are playful and funny. Um, and that tone is throughout the documentary. So Edgar Wright has a lot of fun with, uh, credits. So like Pat Oswalt will come up, but like the way he like says what someone does or is, uh is funny like Edgar Wright himself is in the documentary in the bottom it just says fanboy um so like there's a lot of like little irreverent touches like that um a ton of super influential musicians and comedians and performers are in the documentary talking about sparks and the film really just takes you through the entire thing it's over two and a half I think it's two hours 20 minutes something like that and it flies by and Edgar Wright said he had toyed with a shorter cut, but it felt like it breezed over things, but you feel like you really are getting into every single album, every single up and down of their career, what they were thinking at the time, the bands they influenced, like they were doing synth sounds before that was cool in the eighties. And so like all of these famous bands now that are famous for these sounds, um, seem to have been influenced by sparks and sparks just has been underrated for 50 years. 
Uh, and it's just, I don't know. I, I absolutely loved it. it. It's really a love letter to this band and a love letter to like artists who continue to perform and strive to make good art regardless of like levels of success or notoriety or anything else and just kind of stay true to who they are through the entire thing. Um, and if you like any of Edgar Wright's films, you'll, you'll love this one. But yeah, I was, I was just floored by this movie. I, I had a blast with it and I can't wait to watch it again. Yeah. I, I felt the same way. Um, it was like my second favorite of the fest and the only, and the first one, my, my, my favorite of the fest is sort of like, with an asterisk because it'll be on HBO max in less than two weeks. And that's Judas and the black Messiah, but it did play at Sundance. It technically qualifies as a Sundance movie. <laughs> yeah. I'm um, just realizing I never even put it on my list. And I have a feeling that's the reason why I just like, didn't think of it. Yeah. You just don't think of it as a Sundance movie. I'm going to include it just because uh, we'll talk more about it. I think in a couple of weeks, but um, I thought that that was just really well done. Um, I, I won't get too much into that. In fact, I want to use this to, to bring attention to another film I liked another documentary I liked called Misha and the Wolves, um, which was one of those, I think Netflix has picked it up. So you'll be able to see it hopefully this year. I but watched it's one of, this night because of you. Oh, what, what did you think of Misha and I the thought Wolves? I thought it was great. It's, it's one of those like stranger than fiction stories that then like reveals itself to have all these new layers to it. Um, the, the hook is that there was this uh, sort of this Belgian woman named Misha and she claimed that as a child um, her parents were arrested by the Nazis and, and shipped off and she went she was forced to live with this Catholic family and chose instead to run away and go to Germany to find her parents and on the way she lived with wolves and it's sort of this like oh what an amazing tale of 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 perseverance and 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 you know nature you know you know coming and protecting this young 7 year old girl and then and then the things start you know i'm not going to spoil it go in cold but you know <laughs> uh but it's it's a really well done documentary uh, kind of reminded me of the way it's sort of how methodical it is if you saw um the imposter uh, it sort of reminded me of that, that sort of like, here's the deception and he, we're going to sort of unravel exactly why people believe the things they believe. And I thought it was really strong. So, uh, that's one I think people should put on their radars. It feels especially perfect to be distributed by Netflix too. Oh yeah. Net, yeah. That's a, that's a good home for it. It's definitely one of those types of movies where, and I'm not saying this because it didn't feel full, but after you watch it, you can't help but to start Googling and read and learn even more. I loved how it operated on so many levels, though. It's, you know, it really does embrace that. You guys curse on this show? Yeah, we curse. <laughs> okay. It, like the, the what the fuckness of it all. Like yeah, it embraces yeah. that and it, I mean, I don't want to say it lets you have fun with it, but it it does it does have a, a major entertainment factor to it. But then it does dig into a couple of other things that are that are far more weighty, just as far as what it means for someone to be abusing history like that. And and then also I I really did appreciate the part of the movie that taps into what storytelling means to people and what that meaning could then do to, I guess, the truthfulness of it all and what you might be open to. Yeah. I just it worked on a whole bunch of different levels for me. Yeah, it's a good one. So that sounds that's really good, especially like I've watched a lot of true crime documentaries recently, and so many. I also feel like I'll be gone in the dark has like ruined. It's kind of like the like level up of the genre mm -hmm. of like this is how you do justice to survivors and victims and not glorify the murderer. And then I've seen so many recently that are just into the, like the Night Stalker docuseries is horrible. Just like cry, like here's a woman talking about her grandmother who was murdered and how much she loved her. And then it's like, and here are seven photos from the crime scene. So you can look and see all these things. Um, and it's just kind of like, what, like there's nothing added there, but this sounds like a documentary that's like about something it that is. doesn't just tell the story, but then like, what does that story mean? And like, mm -hmm. what does this mean to everyone else in the larger context? Yeah. Sorry, I just, I hope more people watch this instead of Drifle that's on Netflix all the time. No, I mean, that's the thing. And and I was, you know, it's funny, like you sort of, you know, we were talking about, you know, distributors come to these things and like, there weren't really that many acquisitions this year, I think, because I mean, Coda was obviously the big one. Uh, Jockey was picked up by Sony Pictures Classics. 
Um, and then Mission and the Wolves by Netflix. And I, th- I mean, I'm, I'm searching for anything else. And maybe like stuff will eventually find its audience. Who knows? But, um, you know, I, I mean, I'm sure some, I don't think Sparks Brothers has been picked up yet, but I'm sure it will be. Just, I think you can. Edgar, I keep saying you'll see it soon, which makes me think there's something. There's happening. probably already something there's in place. Already. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder there's if there's going to be a whole slew of deals coming our way soon because it mm. feels like this, this year still calls for it. I mean, aren't all these outlets hungry for content right now? Yeah, whether, that's... whether or not the quality of the movies call for certain price tags, I feel like we're just in a position where these entities need these movies. No, absolutely. Like I can see something like, like I didn't personally think Marvelous in the black hole was anything special. Like I thought it was all right. Um, but it's, it's, it's kind of sweet and it's kind of funny and it's got, you know, it's got a little bit of personality to it. And I can easily see like, you know, some streamer being like, yeah, we'll, we'll pick that up. You know, why not? If it's not too expensive. Sonnen's is weird though. I remember Dee Reese talking about how everyone was giving her grief for selling Mudbound to Netflix. And she was like, Nobody talked to us. Like they screened mm. their movie and no one came to them. No one wanted the movie. Like it got good reviews. No one wanted to distribute it. And she was like, that was the only option I have. So you never really know what's going on behind the scenes with these actors right. and stuff. So I'll, I, but I definitely agree. I mean, streamers are hurting for content. Like I saw stuff that I think, I mean, I think how it ends, like Perry, you saw how it ends. I think you just market that as like this movie was shot during COVID and you can tell. Yeah. Like it's just, they're using the streets of Los Angeles as their set because they're not going on a stage. And every cameo interaction is very clearly like 10 feet apart, like very distractingly. So um, it's uh, but like, I think that's a way to sell it, at least. I feel like I appreciated that one more so from a behind the scenes angle. Yeah. Like I enjoyed the fact that you could tell they were totally embracing the need to make content during a pandemic. Like it, it almost felt like all of that, even though it was slightly distracting, was done in a loving manner. And I loved how the idea of that whole ensemble knowing each other and just wanting to come together and make something like that radiated off the screen to me more than anything. And it's also like, I can totally buy that. And maybe it's true, but I was just like sitting there thinking like, are Rob Pupil and Paul Shear really neighbors? Like, are they just standing in front of their real houses shooting I, this scene where they're yelling at each other? notes had said that some of the cast members filmed in their own backyards. Okay. So yeah. probably that not everybody, but some yeah. of them, yeah. I will happily take two thirds of a human giant re- re- reunion. <laughs> it's funny. It's a, and that's like a pleasant, like delightful spin on an apocalypse movie. That's not really about the apocalypse. It's kind of about self-love more than anything. And like, it's fine. It's pleasant. I think it could do pretty well. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I just feel like, you know, Sundance, it's not that it's even like a forgettable year as much as it's just like it was a constrained year, you know? Yeah. But I would say even the fact that like there were still movies to recommend out of it and like films that you want to share with people, I think that that's a success. It just, you know, I it's funny going into Sundance this year, I'm like, oh, this is great. I'll just like watch movies in my pajamas and I don't have to like walk through the cold or be up super early because all the screenings start at noon. But honestly, it was a be careful what you wish for because mm-hmm. I, you know, after doing it this year, I'm like, yeah, send me back to park city <laughs> yeah. because I want to, I need to ride that momentum and like be in that atmosphere. If I'm going to appreciate Sundance because saying, Oh, well, we'll put some indies on your TV is, is just not enough. Just I will nice. happily have a granola yeah. bar for dinner every night while standing in line at Echoes. I will eat nothing but garbage pizza from Domino's. <laughs> a very warped idea of time right now, but it, it almost feels like Sundance hurt more than Tiff to not mm, physically yeah. be there because Sundance was one of the last things we did before everything yes. shut down. And for whatever reason, like even though it's a year later now, it still feels like just yesterday in a sense. Like I feel like I'm able to make a more direct comparison Sundance to Sundance than I have been with any other event that went virtual this year. No, I think that's a really good observation. Yeah. Uh, well, hopefully next year we will do a, we will do a podcast from, from Sundance from Park City, Utah. All right. Well, with that in mind, um, let's let's talk about recently watched. Uh, Perry, what have you seen lately that uh, you think people should know about? That isn't Sundance. It can be. It doesn't matter. Just what do you want to? What do you? Okay. What, what do you? What, what do you see lately that's stuck in your mind that you haven't talked about? 
on this episode so far. I'll, I'll give you one that I truly did enjoy. And this was one of the the movies that I was kind of hinting at earlier where my, uh, my Sundance coverage and non-Sundance coverage kind of overlapped because there was no way I was saying no to an interview with Sam Neill, which was hands down one of the greatest things that's ever happened in my professional life. But I genuinely liked his movie Rams. It is about he so Sam Neill plays a sheep farmer in Australia and what happens is there's this deadly disease that one uh, one of the flock becomes infected with and the government swoops in and demands that all of the sheep farmers in the area they purge their flocks and he basically finds finds a way around that in a sense but the movie tonally is like all over the place. It goes deep into the tragedy of it all, but then also has this really goofy sense of humor to it. And I think it's because that ensemble led by Sam Neill is so good that it's actually able to maneuver all maneuver through all of that fairly seamlessly. And it's, it's sad at times, especially for someone who's very sensitive when it comes to anything relating to animals, but it's got a real sweet quality to it and a, an uplifting nature that I thoroughly enjoyed. Good to know. Keep, keep Rams on my radar. Yeah, it comes out <laughs> on uh, VOD February 5th, I believe. Oh, all right, this Friday. Uh, all right, uh, Adam, what, what have you seen lately that you want to talk about? Uh, it's mostly just been <laughs> Sundance and uh, Mike Nichols movies, which I think we should make an announcement at the end of this podcast. Oh, we are. What, oh, we are. <laughs> what, so, okay, get ready because we have a big announcement coming up for next week's podcast. Uh, but I did want to mention one Sundance movie that uh, that I watched that I didn't really know much about it and went into it and uh, found it super fascinating. There's a documentary called My Name Is Polly Murray. Um, I had never heard of Polly Murray before. It's from the filmmakers of RBG, which I thought was okay. Um, Polly Murray was born in 1910 and Polly was an activist who seemed to be at the forefront of a lot of civil rights and, and gender equality legislation. So Polly Murray like helped like essentially had like the kernels of the ideas that then push forward, like Thurgood Marshall's um, uh, you know, Brown versus Board of Education was also named as a co-author on Ruth Bader Ginsburg's uh, presentation to the Supreme Court on gender equality, ruling the 14th Amendment called for gender equality. What was fascinating about Polly's story is that uh, like, so Polly, through like personal diaries and stuff, it was clear that Polly always felt like, uh, and the reason, so Polly always felt like they were a man trapped in a woman's body. But what the documentary kind of illuminates is that in like the 1920s and 30s, there was no name for this. And Polly didn't know what kind of it meant or anything. And, you know, most of Polly's life, their family members and their friends assumed Polly was a lesbian. Um, and their family members and friends in the documentary use she, her pronouns. Um, and a lot of scholars use she, her pronouns, but members of the transgender community now kind of use they, them pronouns or just call uh, Polly Murray Polly. Because it, you know, again, there was no name for it, but in these personal diaries, you know, Polly talked about being attracted to, you know, heterosexual, very feminine women, um, but always felt like Polly wanted to be kind of the man in the situation. And so it was just kind of, really illuminating and kind of sad for me for someone to, you know, live through life. And Polly went to a lot of doctors to try and figure out what was going on and what was wrong. But this was not something that was like publicly talked about. And and for all of, you know, all of the progress we still have yet to make, we have made progress. Uh, and, and that, you know, people in the transgender community, uh, like we have a name for it, people can speak out, uh, people can live openly. Uh, that's not to say there's not prejudice or anything, but it was just kind of interesting seeing this person at, at the forefront of all of these issues was secretly and privately kind of having a, an internal struggle. Um, and yet was still, you know, pushing forth this, this really groundbreaking legislation and lived just really a tremendous life. Um, so I don't know, it was just kind of like an eye opening, uh, uh, portrait of someone I didn't know about who did a lot of things that were important, but, you know, also kind of got me thinking about, you know, what it must have been like to live like that in the 1920s and 1930s and not really have any kind of, not even a support system, but like no one to tell you this is what this is. It's like it's just a lot of confusion. That's so, not even have the language for it. Yeah, there was no language for it. So uh, that documentary, I, I would I would recommend checking out. It's, it's really fascinating. Yeah, I'll, now it's on my radar. Um, so for me, uh, like you said, we've been working our way through Mike Nichols movies. And so, uh, I recently watched his 1986 film Heartburn with Meryl Streep and Jack Nicholson, uh, 
written by Nora Ephron based on her uh, autobiographical book. Um, it's about this uh, magazine writer who meets this um, uh, Washington uh, newspaper columnist uh, played by Nicholson. And it's kind of a portrait of their marriage. And it's based on Nora Ephron's marriage to Carl Bernstein um, and how he cheated on her. And like, that's what what's interesting about Heartburn is I don't think it works completely, but I'm fascinated by it because it sort of captures the highs and lows of a marriage. It's a little disjointed, but I think purposefully so, because it's more about the emotional state about how, you know, you can love someone and think that they're going to change and you're going to blind yourself to the fact that they may not change or that you can, you know, be with someone who breaks your heart and yet still have some of the best moments of your life with them. And it's really, I think really mature. And I, I mean, it was kind of panned at the time, but I think it's, it's pretty insightful. And I think Streep and Nicholson are fantastic, especially Streep um, as always, but um, it's a, it's a pretty, I think it's sort of an underrated gem in Nichols filmography. And I think, uh, it's worth checking out. It's currently on Amazon Prime Video, if anyone wants to check out Heartburn. Um, I guess at this point I should say, so why have we been watching all these Mike Nichols movies? You've probably guessed by now. Uh, earlier this week, uh, the book uh, Mike Nichols, A Life was released. And on next week's episode, we will be very pleased to have the author Mark Harris on with us to talk about the book and to talk about the films of Mike Nichols. So we're very excited for that episode uh, and we hope that you'll join us. Um, if you want to keep up with this podcast, you should follow us on Twitter. Uh, Perry, where can people find you on Twitter? Uh, you can find me at P. Nemiroff. And Adam, where can people find you? At Adam Chitwood. And you can find me at Matt Goldberg. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll be back with you next week. Perry, thank you so much for joining.